Hello Mage fans and potential Mage fans. My name is Adam Simpson. I am the solo host today for Mage the Podcast. I have uh, been given the keys to the podcast, so I promise not to wrap it around a tree. <laughs> we'll see how well I do. I wanted a chance today to talk to you about uh, themes in Mage the Ascension. Now when I say themes, I don't mean the theme of a campaign or a theme that a storyteller is trying to emphasize uh, for, say, tonight's game session. I'm talking about themes of the game as a whole, the underlying themes that the line developers or that uh, mage fans have perceived about the game. Uh, these ideas that really express what the game is about and what the game can uh, emphasize for mage players to make it more significant. Uh, I'm going to start today with the theme of the first edition of mage. Uh, now back at that time there was no line developer yet. Uh, it was effectively uh, developed by Stuart Wick who was uh, working for White Wolf at the time. He had help from uh, two or three people but uh, uh, everyone acknowledges that it was uh, mainly his creation. So first edition hit the shelves in 1993 and in it Stuart Wick emphasized the theme of uh, mages. You know, all mages who use true magic uh, are dynamic trailblazers who bring change to society. And if you read through the first edition uh, core book, that, uh, that paperback, you will see uh, several places in the book where this is emphasized. I mean, quick example, uh, back at the end of the 1960s, uh, we all know about the famous uh, Woodstock uh, outdoor um, concert, or perhaps I should say series of concerts uh, that forever changed American society. Well, according to Mage First Edition, Woodstock was started by cultists of ecstasy who decided it was time for change and they brought that change themselves. They got the whole thing started and uh, inspired um, sleepers, you know, non-mages, to uh, show up and play their music and uh, give their messages and uh, just have a, a major event. And of course there are other uh, examples to be found in the first edition book. Now this theme uh, for mage was not emphasized so much in um, once second edition got rolling and in later editions of the game, but uh, I, I really like this theme that uh, Stuart Wick was trying to communicate. I thought that it was uh, very much a part of that early first edition era where Mage was very high concept, big ideas. It was uh, really taking a uh, wide angle lens look at the world and Mage's places in it. Um, well, how can you use this theme at your own game tables? I mean, it is pretty, pretty big talk here. How, how can you emphasize during actual gaming sessions with your players how they are um, dynamic trailblazers, how they are uh, people who are bringing future large changes to society in their everyday actions? I want to throw out two examples for how you can really uh, really try this yourself. Uh, first example, uh, let's say that the uh, Celestial Chorus, uh, one of the nine mystic traditions, is looking at some activity in uh, Southeast Asia. Let's say, I don't know, Laos, um, uh, for example. And uh, you could say there is a nonprofit group from the country of Japan, and uh, they are kind of like missionaries from a um, Buddhist uh, temple there in Japan and they've decided that they are really concerned about the poor living conditions and corruption and other problems happening in the country of Laos and so they send some of their people over there to help out. Now, of course these are regular sleepers, no, no mages in there, but the Celestial Chorus is taking a look at this and saying hey uh, this is going to bring about some real long-term change in the whole region of Southeast Asia if we can just um, reinforce this effort. So they take one of the player characters who is a, a member of the Celestial Chorus and they say hey we really want you to infiltrate this group of say Buddhist missionaries we want you to get in there, uh, make it look like you're one of them, earn their trust, help them out in what they are doing, 
and also uh, protect them. Um, not only help their efforts, but um, if, if any opposition comes against them that is out of their league, uh, you know, have their back. Uh, keep them safe from that. So, what the Japanese visitors are really doing is helping locals overcome their long-standing traditions of ethnic strife uh, there in Laos, not with people outside of, La of Laos. Uh, also, helping people overcome their total obedience to traditional authority figures. Uh, the character's cabal needs to uh, get in and help this foreign NGO, uh, help them with tr the tricky negotiations that are ahead of them, help them with uh, unhappy local authorities that do not like uh, foreign um, uh, manipulation. Uh, also, some local powers start to attack the Japanese visitors. Is this the uh, Nefondus? Is this uh, uh, members of the Wu Kang um, uh, sort of craft? It's a, a group of mages that are not part of the technocracy or part of the traditions. Uh, so, is it part of the Wu Kang? Uh, perhaps the technocracy syndicate uh, doesn't like what's going on and it's going to start causing trouble. So this kind of adventure will involve uh, social skills uh, during negotiations with local sleeper authorities. It's going to involve subtle magics uh, to find out who is causing problems for these Japanese visitors in Laos. There can also be some combat and investigation to track down the uh, awakened magical threat and deal with that. Uh, so, uh, again, the idea is that one of the players at your game session is a uh, Celestial Chorus member and that the other uh, players are members of that cabal and they decide to basically go along, uh, help out their cabal mate, make sure that everything's okay. Okay, let's look at the second uh, possible example. Now let's say uh, the Virtual Adepts, another one of the nine mystic traditions. Now the Virtual Adepts are really taken with this view of the internet, uh, telecommunications, networks, and how that can bring a very bright future for humanity. And the virtual adepts not only talk about this, but they're really working towards this. They want the internet to be a place where everyone is participating, everyone is benefiting, and everyone uh, has what they need to keep themselves uh, safe from attackers, and uh, malware and other sorts of things. And so to pursue this long-term societal goal, <clears throat> let's say the virtual adepts are distributing a small electronic device. Um, now in our real world, there's a device called the Pi Hole, P-I Hole. Uh, this is a, a little bitty um, electronic device with a plastic case. Um, it uh, uses, I believe it's a USB cord to connect to a regular sort of desktop or laptop computer and once you have the proper software on there and it's connected it, it piggybacks on your computer now this is all real stuff and what it does is it blocks ads it blocks adware it blocks uh, spying so um, it helps a person keep their uh, interactions with the internet more anonymous when they get to web pages instead of these ads at the top of the page or to the side or like inserted into the text they're trying to read that it'll just be a blank white space this is gone so uh, uh, a lot of people are getting excited about the pie hole but let's get back to mage so the virtual adepts have their own device and you know you can make up your own name for that and they are distributing that to the public they're trying to get it to really catch on with people especially young people <clears throat> so towards that end the virtual adepts have decided they're going to load up this little device with uh, popular resources for online games and social media all these things that young people are, are really going to want to use uh, when they use the internet so it gets popular. They've created memes and put it through, you know, message boards and websites all through the internet so that younger people are starting to talk about it, starting to go looking for it. And when they do, they find it and it's, it's free or very cheap. Uh, also, this device that the virtual adepts are distributing has um, special um, capabilities built into it that blocks uh, high-level spyware from, say, I don't know, the New World Order and the Syndicate or, or things like that. So it can help 
uh, sleeper internet users to be more secure, more safe, and um, not constantly annoyed by advertisements, etc. Now, as the virtual adepts are distributing this, they pull in one of the player characters and say, hey, we, we want you to uh, uh, overcome some barriers so that we can place uh, uh, notifications about this in places on, on the web, uh, maybe put some resource files in the digital web, uh, which is a virtual space in uh, the game of Mage the Ascension, where virtual adepts are very active. Uh, not many sleepers um, know about or can even get to the virtual web, but the virtual web has um, resources, files, etc., that have an effect and connection to the regular internet that everyone uses. So, this virtual adept player at your table is going to want to put resources in the digital web. There might be some resistance to that. They're going to want to go out to you know cities in the real world and put this device in the hands of regular sleepers and the rest of the players in your group can kind of support that. Perhaps it's a side story that's happening um, at the same time as the main plot that you're running for your group of players. Now some resistance arises. Um, as expected, uh, the New World Order or perhaps the Syndicate is giving some trouble. But what is really surprising is as your player character is distributing this device, he starts getting attacked by marauders which is very rare. Marauders don't appear very often in most people's campaigns, but for some reason they're coming out of the woodwork to attack this device, and it just doesn't make any sense. What could this be? What is this device to the marauders? You can get into this in your own game, and uh, that would be a second example of how your own players during game sessions can be these trailblazers who are uh, bringing their vision of the future into the real world and making it a part of society for the sleepers. Now let's move on to a second theme for the game of Mage the Ascension. Um, Satiros uh, Bricado, uh, he's publishing these days under the name Satiros Phil Bricado, was the line developer for the second edition of Mage in the 1990s, and he is back now as the line developer of uh, Mage 20, or Mage 20th edition, which is effectively the fourth edition of Mage the Ascension. Bricado said in a 2018 uh, broadcast interview, that or podcast interview, I'm sorry, that the theme of Mage the Ascension is empowerment. Now, this is backed up by page 2nd of the 2nd edition core book, where it says, At its core, Mage is about giving a damn, about caring and believing in something so deeply that your beliefs can change reality. Uh, now, of course, empowerment is um, a, a broad idea. Uh, most of us know that uh, empowerment is something that can come to all people, whether uh, sleepers or mages. Everyone can have an influence on the world and bring change to the world. But I think what Bricotta was really trying to say is that because mages can use sphere magic, they have access to powers and knowledge that uh, sleepers are never going to have. And so because of that, they are greatly empowered. Uh, they not only have an influence on the world, but can have a very strong influence on the world. And so how can you bring this to the game table? Uh, well, I'm going to give an example. Let's say the uh, player's cabal is uh, settled into an area to fight the technocracy there, say a section of a city. Uh, you've got uh, three players in your cabal. There's a hermetic mage who uses his knowledge and forces to fight hit marks head on. Uh, hit marks are uh, dangerous agents of the Iteration X, which is a convention of the technocracy. Uh, You've got the Verbena Mage using life magic to make technocrats waste away from diseases. You've got a virtual adept who uses her skills to shut down important networks and confound field agents of the technocracy's communications. Now, these three players are working hard. They are fighting the technocracy head on. By the end of your story, a couple of, of gaming sessions, um, the player group has won. They have struggled hard, fought effectively, and they have either killed the technocracy agents in this area or shut them down and made them withdraw. So, flushed with victory, 
they start to notice some changes in their neighborhood. Uh, over one or two sessions towards the end of your story, uh, you make it known to your players that uh, plants, trees, and people's pets are getting sick and dying off. Um, the whole, you know, flower gardens and sections of trees are withering away and dying. Uh, elemental spirits in the near Umbra in this area are raging out of control. Apparently they've seen the Hermetic's forces magic and these elemental Umbrud spirits have uh, taken that as an example to follow. And so there are electrical storms, houses are losing power, fires are starting, people's homes are uh, catching fire, some are even burning down. Uh, freak wind storms that cause all kinds of damage in the neighborhood, etc. You can, you can run with that and uh, give a couple examples to your players. Also, homes and offices are uh, getting damaged by uh, attacks on, well, not so much attacks, but failures on the internet. Uh, for example, local hospitals and clinics, uh, even uh, public schools, are having a terrible time because their network computers are constantly breaking down. Uh, their records are either getting deleted or they can't get access to it. Uh, there's all kinds of trouble uh, for these uh, schools, clinics, homes, etc. And um, the players start to realize uh, that they have had uh, a very direct influence on this city in which they're operating, uh, an accidental um, consequence of what they've been doing. See, they were trying to help the sleepers by fighting off these technocracy that were doing harmful things, and they succeeded, and that's great. But the players, uh, if done properly, are starting to realize that it's not just what they do with their magic, it's also how they do it. The players have been making technocrats sick and diseased and uh, knocking them uh, out of the fight, but also the resonance of that life magic to cause disease and illness and sickness and death is leaking out into the area and killing off the plants, killing people's pets, people's kids are getting sick. Um, the hermetic mage who thought, uh, hey, I'll just use my forces magic, wipe out these hit marks, it's, it's what I'm good at, it, it's effective, uh, let's just cut to the chase and wa knock out these enemies. But there are uh, umbrid spirits uh, who are much like elemental forces when seen in the near umbra, and uh, they're almost mindless. Uh, they're not intelligent creatures. They react to these strong forces magic attacks and they rage out of control on their own. And also the uh, virtual adept who uh, is, is so proud of her ability to shut down all the technocrats' communications, she's also cutting down sleeper communications and making life difficult for sleepers. So hopefully by the end of your story you've given your players something to think about. Hey, I have a very strong effect not just on the enemies I'm fighting but on the greater world around me. Maybe I should stop and think about what, what am I really doing? How am I accomplishing my goals? What are going to be the consequences of me settling into an area and operating there for a while? Am I good for the sleepers or am I bad for the sleepers? And uh, hopefully this will cause some, some good discussion and uh, maybe even some change of tactics for your players for the next story you start up uh, with their characters. <clears throat> Now those are themes from uh, line developers of or effective line developers of the first two editions of the game. I'm going to switch gears now and get into themes that I myself have perceived as a mage fan uh, running the game and reading the game books for years now. I have seen I'm going to say four basic themes to Mage the Ascension that uh, reveal themselves to me again and again as I, as I work with the game and, and talk with my friends who play the game. I'm going to list these four off. Uh, first off, we've got the idea that magic isn't just something you do, it's something you're a part of. Second theme is uh, the idea of needing to work with others who are very different from yourself 
needing to get along with them to resolve disputes and work together towards a common goal even though they may not be people uh, you like or want to be around. Okay, third theme is Mage the Ascension is about uh, transcending your limitations. Now when I say transcending your limitations I mean uh, not just becoming more powerful or more wealthy or more knowledgeable, but becoming a better person. Uh, like what, uh, say, Confucius in his old Chinese writings called uh, cultivating one's self. Becoming a better person, uh, working the uh, negative aspects of your character and your outlook out. Uh, this is reinforced in the game by the notion of seekings. And I'll uh, get into that more in a moment. Uh, just briefly, the fourth, fourth theme that I have seen is the notion of overcoming your pride and self-centeredness and reaching for something higher, something greater than um, self-aggrandizement, uh, something greater than increasing your power or influence or knowledge, something greater even than what you thought were good and honest and helpful things. Uh, learning more about the world and about other people so that you have a better idea of what is good and what is helpful and then reaching for that, making it a real part of your life. Okay, now these are the four themes that I have seen in the game. Let's get into some examples so that it's not just vague talk or fun discussions online, but something that's really a part of your game, something that, that is um, reinforced at the game table for your players, and it gives them something to chew on when they go home uh, after the game is done. So let's circle back to that first theme. Magic isn't something you do, it's something you're a part of. With a lot of uh, role-playing games, especially the fantasy role-playing games, magic is a skill that you learn. It's something that you can do that you couldn't do before. You can accomplish your goals. You can solve problems with it. But when you stop using it, it, it disappears. It doesn't have any effect on you anymore. I'm not using magic now, so you know I'll go do something totally different. And um, magic is, is not something I'll even think about until I use a spell again. Uh, the most that you can hope for is that someone might come to you and, and talk to you about the magic spells you've been doing, but, but that's the end of it. Now, Mage the Ascension is very, very different, and that's what makes it so interesting for people like me. When a character in the world of Mage um, awakens to magic, they aren't just learning it, they aren't just capable of uh, doing spells or um, effects. They are suddenly aware of the magic that is in the world. And they are not only aware of it, but uh, they're a part of the magical landscape. They are sensitive to magical effects, magical phenomenon that is occurring around them. Um, magical beings, uh, you know, Umbrud, uh, other mages, um, bygone creatures, um, etc. These things are aware of the mage when they weren't before. So it's, um, let's see, the example is used often in the books of uh, walking through the curtain. The sleepers are out in the regular part of the world. Um, not only do they not know magic or use magic, but they're not even aware of it, and magical uh, phenomenon and beings don't pay any attention to them. They're not part of their world. But when a mage awakens, they go through the curtain, they're in a different place now. They are uh, interacting with um, magical creatures and, and so on. So how can we uh, make this part of your game? Well, I would say to I would say the best way to do this is to introduce weirdness into the mage's life. Um, they notice not only more supernatural things, but um, the ideas, the powers, the people behind that magic. Uh, when other mages do powerful magic, they not only hear about it, but they feel it. Um, strange things happen in their lives, and these strange mystical occurrences are sometimes good, sometimes bad, and often neither. They're not really good or bad, they're just really odd things that are occurring. Uh, you can use these effectively as um, things thrown into your game, not the main um, 
plot of your game, not the main conflict that your players are dealing with, but just little distractions, little odd things that happen now and then that your players may latch onto and think are part of the plot and turn out to be uh, just rabbit trails, just, just meaningless things that don't connect to anything else. Uh, for example, you could have an umbra, a, a being or spirit from the umbra, um, approach them. Uh, they, well, let me just uh, take a look at my notes here. Okay, here's an example. Um, for a week, this one mage player in your game has been seeing things in threes. They see identical triplets walk down the sidewalk. And then later in the session or the next session, they see three balloons of the same color. Their strings are tied together, and they float by a window when they're they're having a some scene indoors uh, dealing with uh, cabal mates or some NPCs. Uh, they keep noticing. They they look up uh, when a public clock is uh, chiming three o'clock. Uh, just this number three is reinforced again and again to the player, and and they don't know why. When they look into it, there's no reason behind it. Then a, uh, a were raven. This is a, a Korax, a shape-shifting uh, raven from you know Werewolf the Apocalypse, another game that is part of um, the World of Darkness by White Wolf. This uh, were raven shows up suddenly in the mage's home or where the mage is staying, and talks to your player and demands to know why the mage is messing with the local flows of spirit energies. And of course, your your player is not. Uh, messing with any of these spirit energies and doesn't know what's going on, doesn't even know what this is about. It turns out that a mystic phenomenon tied to time or spirit, uh, these are spheres of magic, has caused a magical vortex to appear every 300 years. A magic doorway to the realms of dream open up um, and uh, this happens, um, say, in the neighborhood of the mage or near where the mage is, you know, currently operating in the story. And so the the Korax, the Were Raven, is accusing the player of being the cause of this. And of course, the player isn't the cause. And so, as a you know, little side story, uh, say your player will go and investigate this uh, dream vortex and and find out, oh, this is this has nothing to do with me. It happens every three hundred years, and uh, find some way to explain this to the Korax and, and get it to go away, or maybe um, help um, rechannel the energy from this vortex so it doesn't cause problems for all the shape-shifting you know, wear creatures in the area, or perhaps shut it down or uh, shift it to another place. Um, but again, make this, make this a little side story, something that isn't the main focus of your game. And it will uh, you know, reinforce this idea that uh, you're a part of a whole world of mystical occurrences that really don't have anything to do with the player, but they're going to involve the player, whether they like it or not. Uh, here's another one. Uh, a magic doorway to the Oneira, the uh, dream realms, opens up in the floor of the mage's home. Uh, they didn't call for it. They didn't get any advance warning. Just one day they noticed there's this shimmering mystic sort of hole in the floor. And uh, make make it something annoying, like say it's it's blocking the hallway to the bathroom or something. I mean, just really ridiculous here. Of all the places it could have manifested, it's got to be right in the mage's apartment, or or cabin, or wherever it is uh, they call home for now. Uh, the mage can't close it up. No magic, even strong magic, just won't close it. Uh, they can't do anything to even affect it. And if they're not careful, if they try to walk into it, they'll fall right down and end up in the dream realms. And of course, if your player does fall in, um, make it so that it's not terribly dangerous and it doesn't derail your whole chronicle. Give them some way of getting back out again into uh, into the player's own home. But make it make it annoying. Make it something that they have to find a way around. Like say they they get some long boards like at a construction site, and put it over the hole, and they have to walk over that to get to their own restroom. Um, after, say, I don't know, a week or something of game time, the hole just seals up. It just closes itself, goes away, doesn't leave any residue or, or any remains. And um, this is just an example of, of strange mystical occurrences. They're going to pop up, 
and can't be avoided. So let's try another one. An umbrid uh, spirit um, comes out of the closet doorway in the mage's uh, home again, or wherever it is they're staying. This umbrid uh, comes right to the mage and is very upset that your player uh, has an appreciation of Chinese art in, in the, the player's uh, home, or perhaps it could be African art, or whatever you like. Uh, the player's uh, aesthetic appreciation of this style of art is disrupting the aesthetic currents in the aether, whatever that means. The embroid isn't very good at explaining that. The player should, certainly doesn't understand. Now, the embroid forces a dilemma on the player. Either the player can round up all of this artwork and throw it out and solve this problem, which of course is, is going to be ridiculous to the player. Um, and throwing all of this art out would prove their axiomatic alignment with the etheric uh, principles, which, because, which again is going to mean nothing to the player. Or the player can win a riddle contest with the umbrud. And if the player wins, the art can stay, they don't have to redecorate their apartment, and the umbrud spirit will just go away quietly. And if the umbrud wins the riddle contest, then it brings other umbrud spirits with it to reinforce its will. The player has to gather up all their artwork and throw it out. Now, of course, this is not going to be any real kind of problem for your player. It will be an annoyance either way. The whole thing is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the main plot. It's, it's this silly little detail of daily mystic life that is forced on the player and won't go away until they deal with it. Uh, make it quick. Um, if you want to get into a you know, short game session, maybe you can have a few dice rolls for the uh, riddle contest. Um, and of course, if you're having trouble coming up with riddles, just go online and uh, search for riddles or uh, role-playing games riddles. You'll find a lot of good stuff. I certainly did when I, when I tried that a few months back. Uh, so these are three different examples of uh, mystic strangeness that a mage cannot avoid. And, uh, and what I gave you were like annoying sorts of things, but you can also give uh, examples of, of, of other, other things that are not so much annoying, but they're just interesting. And of course, at first they seem really significant, and then when investigated, they turn out to be just, just meaningless. Just a, a daily part of being a mage. So when you use these... Uh, daily strangeness ideas um, uh, sparingly with your players, it will reinforce this idea that um, now that I'm a mage, I'm not just using magic, I'm pulled into its world. And there are going to be odd things that um, are just part of my life now. Life is nothing if not interesting when you're a mage. Let's take a look at the second theme, working with others who are different. Uh, this is not something I've heard the Mage Line developers speak of, but it's something that I see again and again when I uh, read through the Mage books and uh, bring players into my own games. Uh, when first edition was published, the Council of Nine Mystic Traditions were assumed to be uh, the groups that your players would choose when making their characters for the game. And in edition, second edition, revised, and Mage 20, the three editions that followed the beginning of the game, uh, there's still a heavy emphasis on players playing tradition mages. And uh, what you see in the nine traditions is nine uh, groups of mages who are really different from each other. They have different culture, different goals, different um, methods, different histories. But they are together in this Council of Nine because of the Ascension War. They are cooperating to accomplish a common goal against their enemies, the technocracy and uh, other enemy groups of mages that are uh, threatening to wipe them out. So as they do this, the nine traditions are again and again in these situations where they have to cooperate with each other even though there are very great differences and in some cases uh, deadly rivalries uh, from the past. Um, I mean an example of this is the uh, Euthanados and the Akashic Brotherhood uh, had a um, very serious uh, war hundreds of years ago, I think it was called the Himalaya Wars, where they were going to battle against each other and uh, killing each other over differences in their idea of ascension and how to uh, help 
um, sleepers, uh, non-mages uh, nearby. The Euthanados wanted to uh, wipe out, uh, kill certain uh, sleepers to uh, help the uh, Wheel of Dharma uh, roll on uh, in the right way, and the Akashics thought it was terrible to be killing sleepers using magics that sleepers couldn't uh, defend themselves against. And so uh, that war ended hundreds of years ago, but in the traditions in modern times, that uh, problem keeps coming up. But uh, still, even though there's a rivalry and bad blood between them, these two groups have to work together or the technocracy is going to stomp on them. So how can you uh, make this real for your players? Uh, what I do to handle this is uh, what I most often get is players who choose tradition mages. I allow players to take uh, technocracy mages, uh, craft mages, uh, orphans, uh, mages who awakened on their own and are not part of any mystic tradition but have to figure things out on their own. But still, my players keep going back to the nine traditions. They, they like them, they see a lot of potential there, and a lot of times they think that it's an assumption that they need to choose from there. So they come to the table with different tradition mages and uh, they're going to make a cabal, a group, a player group that's going to cooperate and go through your story together. And I want to emphasize this idea that, hey, you guys have made characters from very different uh, backgrounds, very different groups. And um, there are things about each other that you don't understand, you don't feel too good about, but you're going to have to work through that. And the way I emphasize that is in the first game session, uh, I have each player... Uh, pulled aside by NPCs from their own uh, tradition. Uh, NPC mages, say, from uh, the tradition that they're a part of, and pull them aside and talk privately with them. And it says to you know the player character, you're about to uh, join this cabal and work with these other tradition mages, and that's what you need to do. That's a good thing. Go for it. But um, you have been trained and trusted by our tradition for you know these many months, these many years, we have taught you our um, power, we have taught you our secrets, we have shared our history with you, and you are trusted to keep that secret. Uh, these, I, I have the NPC give specific uh, things to the mage. These are the rotes that you have learned, uh, these are the uh, powers that we've taught you that you cannot tell anyone else about. Keep it a secret for just our tradition. Um, also, I'm going to say these are the things that our tradition is doing out in the world right now that we've got to keep secret or, or that project is going to fall apart. Uh, these are um, these specific mages in specific places that are doing things. You've got to make sure never to reveal that secret to anyone else. Uh, for example, you've got a hermetic mage. And so that mage's mentor will pull, will pull the hermetic player character aside and say, hey, uh, we have been teaching you spirit magic and forces magic, and uh, that's because in the future we want you to help with this project in New York City where we are rooting out a dangerous marauder and shutting her down. It's very important. We've got agents already working on that project, and we're not assigning that to you yet, but keep the whole thing secret. Don't tell anybody about this operation in New York City, city Sorry, to shut down this marauder. That is very secret stuff. We have taught you spirit magic, and the way we taught you spirit magic was we told you the names of specific powerful umbrud spirits. We gave you the true names for these spirits. We taught you the specific uh, circle diagram that you draw in chalk on the floor to uh, summon the minions of this umbrud spirit. We have taught you the words to say to force these umbrud spirits to um, follow your commands. This is secret material. Do not show this diagram circle to anyone outside of the Order of Hermes. Do not give these umbrud spirit true names or um, you know, specific command words to anyone outside the Order of Hermes. If we find out that you have leaked this information, there's going to be very real punishment for you. And, uh, you know, that's just an example for the Order of Hermes. For each tradition, I do something similar to that with the player. So the player characters after these, you know, one-on-ones, uh, which don't take very much time, they come back together and they're ready to 
uh, be a team and work through the story that you have for them. And they're not going to be paranoid of each other. I've never seen that happen at my game table. But it is interesting to see how each player is uh, thinking, uh-oh, uh, I've got to work with these guys, but I can't reveal these certain things. I've got to hold something back. And uh, at the same time, they're starting to think, well, what are these guys holding back from me? What are they not telling me? Is, is this something I need to know? Uh, there's a little bit of tension there uh, between the players who have to hide their own secrets as they work together. And of course, in, in future game sessions or future stories, uh, you can have your players mature and decide that uh, their tradition is too secretive and is holding back too much information. And in order to really win the Ascension War and make society a better place for sleepers, they've got to start revealing their secrets uh, to other people. But that's for later game sessions. Let's talk about uh, transcending limitations. This, is, of course, is enforced by Seekings in Mage the Ascension. In order to uh, raise a character's Arete, they have to um, overcome uh, personal problems. So, uh, an example, let's say a virtual adept is talented in science, technology, and related areas. Now, in order to get to a specific section of the digital web where she wants to go, she has to pass these strange AIs that are asking her riddles. Now, of course, this, this virtual adept is into science, technology, uh, learning things, building things, not into riddle games and, and silly stuff like that. So the virtual adept is going to make um, roles, straight roles to solve these riddles with uh, just intelligence or wits, uh, whichever of those traits is lower. No skill can be added to the dice pool. Uh, give them high difficulty, like 9 or even 10, and make the riddles 2 or 3 deep, so a lucky roll is not going to help. The player is frustrated, can't get past these AIs, can't get to the part of the digital web where she wants to go. So she has to um, cooperate with a local group of hollow ones she's heard about who meet in a tea shop. They tell riddles and read their poems and do things the hollow ones like that the virtual adept absolutely hates. Okay, after spending some time uh, with the hollow ones, you allow the player to spend some experience points on the Enigmas skill on the mage character sheet. And uh, then uh, using this skill, the virtual adept can go back to that part of the digital web, face these AIs, make a uh, skill roll with their, uh, their dice pool will have the Enigmas skill dice plus their um, wits or intelligence. You lower the difficulty so that the uh, obstacle is surmountable and uh, then the virtual adept can get through. And so the lesson here is no, one, no mage can specialize. Every mage has got to be open to learning new skills, learning new things, spending time with people that they don't like. Okay, uh, last, let's, or no, the third theme that I found is overcoming your pride and self-centeredness to reach for something higher. Uh, pride is mentioned many times uh, in Mage the Ascension, especially uh, I found in 2nd edition. This is a pitfall that can lead to a mage um, getting uh, wrapped up in themselves, and so they can't uh, raise their irrite stat, they can't um, ascend, uh, they get locked into their own way of thinking and they never advance. Uh, also, it can lead a mage to uh, very fatal problems that is going to open themselves up to getting hurt by um, enemy mage factions out there in the world. <clears throat> so p pride can be a very real problem. So let's get an example for this. I'm starting to run a little long here, so I'm going to try not to stretch this out too long. Um, let's say there's a player who knows uh, mind magic and uses this to push around sleepers like they're puppets. The rest of the cabal needs the player to sneak into a secure area of a technocrat compound and be there at a certain time to carry out their plan. There's only one minimum wage security guard at the door. Hey, this will be easy. A uh, minimum wage sleeper is guarding this door. I mean, how, how hard can this be? Um, if the player attacks the guard, however, uh, hit marks will come in in force. And his mind magics aren't working. There's something about this place where the security guard is sitting that there is um, a reinforced anti-magic put there by technocrats so that any effect that the player tries to use on this sleeper security guard just fails. 
nothing is working. The mage is getting stumped. Uh, he's getting pretty irritated uh, with himself. And after all these game sessions where you've built him up to easily overcome sleepers, easily get past um, any obstacle with his magic, he's reached a point now where he is just absolutely frustrated. Why can't he do something this simple? So um, the mage casts about uh, trying to find a solution to this problem. Maybe you could have him talk with an NPC uh, who tells him, boy, that guard may be an empty-headed Renekop, but right now, to you, he may as well be the emperor of China. You're not going to get past him unless he decides he likes you. And he's not going to let you through until you come up with something he wants. So your player thinks over these words, and eventually he hits on an idea. He uses his talents to talk to other NPCs in the complex uh, who are um, not un you know farther away from these um, anti-magic uh, devices of the technocracy. And he learns from conversations, maybe a little bit of judicious mind magic, that uh, the security guard has a five-year-old kid with medical problems. And constantly caring uh, for this child when off-duty is wearing out the security guard. So the mage uh, offers to hook him up with someone to uh, watch his child uh, while he's off duty so that the uh, security guard has a little bit of uh, free time, you know, something to feel human, maybe go play poker with his sleeper friends or something like that. So the guard appreciates this so much and asks if there's anything he can do for the mage. The mage says, well, actually, my friend forgot her briefcase in the office behind you and I promised I'd grab it for her. You know, it's just going to take a minute. I forgot my badge today. You know, can you help me out here? Guards lets, the guard lets him through, and he's overcome the problem. And so when the session is over, you hope the player goes home uh, thinking over the lesson that's involved here. Magic can't solve every problem, and sleepers can't always be treated like marionettes. If a mage can overcome pride, ascension becomes a possibility. So let's go to theme number four. And uh, let's see, that was, oh, actually, I think I did cover the four themes. Sorry about that. I'm flipping over my notes here. And uh, yeah, I did cover the four themes of Mage and how you can use them at your game table. So uh, hopefully that gave you uh, something to work with, uh, something practical uh, that uh, can benefit your games. Uh, my examples were ideas of my own. And of course, those ideas are not going to be as good as your ideas. But if my ideas gave you some ideas of your own, then I did my job. So uh, thanks for listening today. And uh, I would like to send out a request uh, to you mage fans out there. Um, if you can uh, contact uh, Mage the Podcast and let us know if you have been um, wanting to run mage or always thinking about running mage, but uh, you just haven't been able to do it, you haven't had the chance, or you didn't have what you needed to run the game, hey, let us know. Let us know what is holding you back. What is the problem that's stopping you from, from running Mage and um, being a storyteller uh, to a group of players and, and introducing them to this awesome game? Uh, well, I'm going to wrap up uh, with a few uh, notes uh, for the show. <clears throat> you can find us online at magethepodcast.com. You can also listen to past episodes there and see what you've been missing. You can follow us on Twitter, at Mage the Podcast. Uh, please subscribe to Mage the Podcast um, on iTunes. You can also uh, drop us a review on iTunes. If you like the show, chances are other people are going to like it. So if you leave us a review, it uh, makes the show more visible on iTunes so that other people can find it in their own searches or when they're browsing through. You can also find us on Google Play and the TuneIn app. So we uh, welcome you to come back and hear future episodes. Thanks so much for uh, hearing me out today. And uh, until next time, truth until paradox, baby.